Well, today we're talking about the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. Okay. That, that most grand and superior of all commands. Okay. And then there's a, an attachment in the chat that people want to open up. It's some kind of poster that you got going on. Yeah. Um, I generally refer to, in fact, Mark has one behind his head, pinned to his door. I refer to that thing as the chart, the one with the vertical stripes. So just it, just so anybody knows, if I ever mention the chart, the chart, that was printed in 2010. The, the, uh, the next thing I have that has all the card faces with kind of a black background, all the letters and the different fonts, that's called the array. This next one that uh, we're going to be talking about, yeah, that's the chart there, upside down. Anyway, um, Mark, as long as you have that, I'm going to make reference to that later. Okay. Um, there's something down at the very bottom that I don't know if anybody's ever noticed. Not the very bottom, but nearly. Well, I'll bottom. just I'll just put it on the screen in the edit. Okay. Like, uh, yeah. Well, when I get to that, that'll be later on. That'll be toward the end of the talk. But when I get to towards that, um, I think we'll discuss it. Anyway. This thing that I just had printed, it's available at uh, Ericology Prints, P R I N T S, at gmail.com. Pete and Diana uh, will get it made and can mail it out from uh, Montana. But you're and, still going to have to pay the shipping and handling. They're not going to be able to print. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying, its format is probably about 18 inches wide, and I think it's going to end up being a, nearly three feet long. I'm going to refer to it as the, either the, I guess, I was referring to it as the meta, but I'm going to refer to it as just Yahweh Akkad. Just so you know, the poster of Yahweh Akkad is what this thing's going to be. And that's what you, Kurt, has just put up in the, uh, on the, in the chat room, right? Yep. Okay. So when you say chat room, it's just, it's just chat on the Skype thing. Father, thank you for, uh. Thank you for letting us be alive still. Thank you for waking up Israel and bless this message and this word and let it go as far as you can. In whose name I pray. Amen. Okay, so in Deuteronomy 6, it says, in fact, I don't have it on me. Uh, does somebody want to read it where it says the Shema? In fact, Sally, are you there? You love the Shema. You want to turn on your mic and read that? Sure, I would love to. Yes. Hear, O Israel, Hash Yahuwah is our Elohim. Yahuwah is one, the one and only. You shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and all your soul and with all your resources. And these matters that I command you today shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them thoroughly to your children, and you shall speak of them while you sit in your home while you walk on the way and when you uh, when you walk on the way when you retire and when you arise bind them as a sign upon your arm and let them be ornaments between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates perfect thank you You're so welcome. the interesting thing about this it starts off saying Shema Israel. It's like, well, wait a minute, who's Israel? The following verses that she just read there defines who Israel is. Yahweh Eloheinu. Yahweh is our Elohim. You can stop right there. If this one Yahuwah is not your Elohim, you is not Israel. Period. End of story. If you determine that Yahuwah, you want him to be your Elohim, that means you have the desire in his direction, but it means you are also within yourself personally volunteering 
to relinquish the sovereignty of your own mind, your own heart, your own, as she said, the kola vivka with all your heart, the kola la nefeshka, your own, what's translated soul or spirit, and they call meod deka. Now the word meod, meod is spelled mem aleph dalit. Well, you put that in the English letters and it's M-A-D, mad. That's madly. You remember the Beatles did that song, Love Her Madly? That's what that's re- that re- referred to. What Sally's translation that she read said, with all your resources. Yeah. One translation says, with all your very, <laughs> very, that's not the right use of the word. See, there's a problem. There's a disconnect between the uh, Hebrew the English. So when I said uh, she read it in Hebrew, that, that's what it says. Then for us who are crippled, well, I happen to have a lame f- foot uh, appearing at the moment. But the crippledness of us is that we don't know the Hebrew. We don't get it. Oh, I know how di- I do have a dictionary and I know how to translate the Hebrew word and the English word. That's not that's not really what it says. You have to get it. You have to be able to know what the Hebrew word is talking about, not just how to translate it into French, English, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, uh, Portuguese, some other language. That's not knowing the language. The best technique that I have found or heard suggested anywhere for understanding the language is to look at the spelling of a word letter by letter, reverse engineering the composition of each word and figuring out what the word's talking about. So when you have this word meo deca, mem, alafav dalet, meod, that sounds like two vowels, meo dec, de, d, ka, k. So it sounds like it's m-e-o, D K A. Just trying to give you a little sense of the way this works. It's not necessarily so easy, but mem aleph dalit mad. The aleph is silent. So why wouldn't it be ma da mud mud? So they they supply these vowels, and in the modern Hebrew, it's dots and lines underneath the letters. That's the vowels. There's no vowels in the written letters, and we look at Yo to say that's pronounced as an I or a Y. That sure looks like a vowel. And we look at a Vav, it's an O or a U. That sure looks like a vowel. The ion is sometimes pronounced as an A, an E, kind of a G-H. <sighs> but sometimes it looks like it's an A or a U or an O. or It's not really a vowel. Shema Israel. What does Shema mean? Well, we could say hear or listen, but it's not just hear, it's, it's, it's attend to what you're hearing to the point that you get it and you understand what you're being told and you from within yourself now are responding to what you hear coming in by believing, orienting yourself in the direction of the information and then responding with the appropriate behavior. Now, if you didn't completely understand, like if you tell somebody, hey, close the door, and they go over here and close the door, it's like, no, not that door, this door. Oh, well, they tried. They tried to do what they thought you said, and then if they just push it too, did they close it? Well, you wanted it latched. That's different. Well, it's not different. It's closing the door. It's like, gosh, what are the meaning of these words? How do you affect? What is communication? How do you? How do you? When I say affect, a f f e c t, affect is what do you do from your side of the equation to load, to package, to send some glob of information so that it's effect, E-F-F-E-C-T. When it hits the brain of the listener, they get it accurately. 
How do you do that? Well, we have common use of language, whatever language it might be. Boy, you listen to some people speak. I speak English. You listen to some people speak in a foreign language, and it's like, how is this possible that those people can communicate? The sounds, the noises, language is just a total mind blower. Gosh, how do you ever teach a child to learn? But they do. They do it all the time. They've done it for years. It's like, it's astounding. It's, it's absolutely astounding. There's a certain word has to do with tohu. And there is another word, too, that it's, it means to stand empty of thoughts, astonished, like bewildered, like what? The? Yeah, like that. When I hear people speak words, sometimes they speak so fast. Sometimes the noise is so, it's like how can anybody distinguish these noises and receive the communication accurately? I'm astonished. But that's exactly what Yahuwah built. All of time and space is the stage setting for humanity. The animals, the bugs, the birds, the fish are the various actors on the stage as background for humanity. Humans are the pinnacle of creation. Their body for mobility, their mind and emotions to get them into trouble, to, to bump into various challenges. Hey, I want to climb that mountain. Are you sure? Yeah, why not? Well, we will find out why not. Saw a video the other day, Stan Tenen died recently, and I've, I've complimented his study many times of the group Miru, M-E-R-U, Miru Foundation. And uh, Miru is the name of a mountain in the Himalayas of India, and a, a few people tried to climb it. It's like climbing Mount Everest, and it's like, oh, gosh. Why do we take on these challenges? We're people. That's what we do. We take on impossible challenges, and see that? Those kids on the other side of, uh, Carlo was showing us the Bronx. See those kids that look funny and dress funny and talk funny? Let, let's see if we can challenge them to a scrimmage you know, in, the, in the playground. It's like, why do you do that? Well, just because. So Yahweh has set up these things inside the human mind and the human heart. And then he's, that's the love of Ka is the heart, your, your, the Ka. K A the K sound ending literally means you or yours. So love, Lamed Bet, is heart. Love. Hey, that's where we get the English word love, L O V E. But in Hebrew, it's Lamed Bet, which we would say L B. B is in boy. But the B sound, the Bet, is two vocalizations. One is the like the letter B, and the other one's like the letter V, as in Victor. So in Spanish, the letter B is pronounced two ways, as the B and the V. It's, it's referred to as hard and soft. Same thing in Hebrew and Spanish, very closely related. So when you get, when you get Lamed Bet Bet, you would pronounce it LVV or La Vev. And then with the K at the sound, La Vev Ka. Lavevka, or so it's lavka or lavevka. So when you have two Bs, two bets, well, look up in the dictionary. Bet, bet is a gateway or an entrance. So lavev is kind of like the, the gateway to your heart or the entrance to your very inner being. The word babel, as in the Tower of Babel, and then Babylon, the city, is Bet Bet Lamed. Well, if Bet Bet is a gateway, what's Bet Lamed? It would be pronounced Baal. If you put it Vav Nun at the end, it's Balloon. Balloon. Well, that's that's this thing you fill with air and you float up to the sky because it weighs nothing. You look at in Nun is a suffix or, of that which is the action of 
the action of Bet Lamed, the action of a ball, or the action of to be filled with air and there's nothing there. So you look at Bet Lamed, well, you put a noon in front of Bet Lamed and you get the name Nabal. Well, Nabal was that guy that was married to a lady named Abigail. And remember, David was out and with his men and volunteering to watch over the guy's flocks because there's raiders and trouble out in the field in the wilderness. And David then appealed to the guy for some food or some help. And the guy said, who do you think you are? Get out of here. And David said, that's it. I'm going to go <laughs> go there, tear this guy apart, which wasn't very righteous of David, at least with the elements we have of the story. So he geared up his men and he comes riding into Nabal's where he lived. And he was he was going to he was going to do a genocide on him. And Abigail catches wind of this and hears of it. And she says, what the heck? She she puts together a feast immediately. Now, that's pretty tough to do. But anyway, Nab, uh, Abigail puts together a feast, offers it to David, says, please don't do this. And David gets his wits about him and says, wow, I just about committed a, a, a terrible crime, a sin. Thank you. When he asked who she was, she said, I am Abigail, the wife of Nabal. The word Nabal means fool. And yes, my husband's been living into what his name means. He's been quite a man of nothingness, of foolishness, of just, oh, gosh. David ended up marrying Abigail. But my point is the word Nabal means Foolish, confused, can't tell up from down, does stupid things. He, he can't talk rationally to them. Balloon is that Betlamid concept happening. Betlamid, then if you say Bet Betlamid, it's the gateway to that. Babel is the entrance of this state of bewildered, confusion, perplexity, doesn't know up from down, right from left, babble. And when people talk about the language of Hebrew, hey, this is the one pure, clean lip, Zephaniah 3.9, that Yahweh promised to restore. And it's like, I've heard it said numerous times, oh, God created all the languages. He's the guy who's responsible for the languages. You can't say that languages are bad or wrong. I'm not saying that. Never said languages are bad or wrong. Yahuwah, the Elohim, Kanashamayim Veretz, the, the, the maker, thus creator, and the sustainer of the entire earth and everything in them. He designed the human brain, the physical functioning of the brain. Yes, to deal with work, to deal with like animals, to deal with emotions. Animals can have emotions too. But he built the human mind for language. Well, animals have language, whales and porpoises, and they found uh, even in primates, Stan Tenen was noticing certain gesture language. And, and Stan Tenen's study, just so you know, was he saw every letter shape of the modern Hebrew fit to a hand gesture language. And he was the one who was saying that the cortex of the human brain, you might look at the, use medical term, physiological terms, but just say the brain mass itself. If you could lay a sheet over the whole top of the whole thing, and then open up that sheet, lay it on the table and draw a map, the map of all the Hebrew letters is printed on the Hebrew of the Hebrew letters is printed on the human brain and the location of each letter see we think of letters as just elements that you spell phonetically spell words with well it is that but in Hebrew it also represents numbers so every letter has a different weight or different what you might call a merit the letter bet is the number two okay the letter resh is the number 20 so if you see the letter bet you're not just looking at a b b sound. You see the letter resh, it's not just the er r sound. But when you look at bet, you're seeing the value of two, and somehow that's plugged into your mind, your thinking. When you see the letter resh, it's the value of ten times the letter bet. It's the 
value of 20. But wait a minute, the letter Kof is the number 20. So how do you get Resh 20? Resh is the 20th letter. But Kof is the number 20, the way people have assigned it. People have assigned Kof to be the number 20. You got one through 10, which is Aleph through Yod. So Kof is the 11th letter. And it's easy to remember that in paleo, you hold up your hand. Well, you got you got two letters standing up. Sometimes I draw the letter cough with, with two lines. It's just missing the thumb. So if you hold up this, it's like a cup holding these two in the middle. That's number 11. It's just an easy way to remember it. Well, if the cough is the 11th letter, why do we assign it the value 20? Because in the modern Hebrew, that's what they do. And then Lamed, the next letter, they assign the value of 30. And then Mem, the next, 40. Noon, 50. Well, now you're jumping in increments of 10. Did Yahweh design that? I don't know. People who do gematria, what gematria is? I first heard the term gematria. I was at a uh, meeting put on by the Prophecy Club back, and I think it was like about 1999, it was right before Y2K, 98, 99. And this fellow was saying that you can, Gematria works with the Hebrew, it also seems to work with the Greek, but he said there's only one Bible that it'll work with in English. It's the King James Version, authorized edition, Cambridge edition. It's like, what? He said, oh yeah, you could take the English letters, and what they do there is they take Allah for A, has the value of one. B or bet is the value of two. Gimel, the value of three, or our letter C, pronounced as G. D is the number four, and they do that. And it's like, well, what then do you, when you get to K, does it jump to 20 or is it 11? L, Lamed, is that 30? I don't know. He had it all figured out though, and the guy was real sharp with it. I, I know some people who are just, the gematria is just built in their mind and they can see it and they can throw out the gematria numbers like it was a language, like mathematicians with numbers. And it's like, wow, I don't do that. I'm not denying gematria, but I'm not promoting it because I'm not looking at it. I'm looking at the Paleo Hebrew. But what I'm saying is that Yahweh designed the human brain absolutely, very specifically to communicate with language. And what Stan Tenen found is that the map of the Human out uh, the Hebrew alphabet on the human mind ties the mouth with the eye with the hand. And the gesture is when you move your hand and you put your hand up here, he says, You can see the shape of your hand. I, I can see my hand even with my eyes closed. I know exactly if I was a good enough artist, I could draw a picture of exactly what my hand looks like because it's tied with familiarity to the place our eye goes into our brain and even though i'm not seeing it my brain sees it very interesting very interesting concept what does that mean that means that yahuwah designed humans to communicate i believe because this mishkan pattern in the hebrew alphabet refers to things that yahuwah built before there was humans that it's obviously then of his invention. When I say I believe it to be obvious, that's to say there are many academians and churchmen and scholars, professors, researchers, world-class linguistic authorities who absolutely disagree with me. No, this is human stuff. No, it's not. Why do I say the Hebrew alphabet is not human stuff? Well, Genesis 1, you had six days of stuff being created before humans were made. Once the humans were made, Yahweh rested, declared the seventh day, that's in the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, and then he starts the engagement of his terms of relationship with the humans. The humans had nothing to do with it. And for people to say, oh, yeah, somebody thousands of years later, you know, Moses or somebody decided to write a story about creation and plugged in the sequence of seven days. 
Could he have done that? Well, nobody knows. Maybe he did. I don't believe they did, but some people believe that's what Moses did. Okay. But at least I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to build a case here. Do we have that the seven days of creation were Yahweh's determination? He decided how many days? Why didn't he make 22 days? They, gee, that would be convenient. Why didn't he do three days? That would herald the Trinity. No, he decided seven. Why is seven such a special number? Seven, I re heard, heard referred to as, it's the letter of completion. It's the number of heaven. It's like the word Shin Berayan in Hebrew, Shiva, not only means seven, but it also means, it's, it's, it's not just a number, but it's a concept. It's, it means to swear a vow. It means to fulfill the vow. It means satisfied, like a vow fulfilled. It's the word surfeited. So you look in English, surfeit, surfeited, strange word. Well, why do they call the white foam on the beach when the waves roll in the surf? Same word. It's like you have the body of the water and then you have the wave and the foam on top. It's like, okay, everything has been fulfilled, promised you dessert, here's your dessert, but I'm gonna throw ice cream on top. Woo hoo, that's the surfeiting. That's the overflowing. That's the satisfying and then some. Give a kiss and a hug, sort of a concept. So when, when Yahuwah says that the measure that he gives is good measure, well, there's the basic fulfilling, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. Hey, there's the concept of seven. See, when you, when you start to look at the meanings of certain words and associate them to certain other things, and then you read a verse that describes the very thing, there you go. That's Yahweh's character and nature. Pressed down, shaken together, overflowing, fulfilled, and then more. So in Leviticus 26, when he says, if you guys consider my things to be loathsome, reprehensible, abhorrent, or casually disregard, I'm going to mirror it back to you, Gimel Mem, times seven. What do you mean times seven? The same thing and more. That's the way he does stuff. When he blesses, he gives us what he said and more. When we catch the curse, as in Leviticus 26, we get the same thing of our own attitude and more. That's the number seven. So why is there seven days? It, he's communicating a message. Why is there seven Moedim, the festivals of Leviticus 23? Because it's not just seven festivals, it's communicating a message. The interesting thing about the Moedim, we could learn all this stuff. We could learn about the language, we could learn how to count the numbers, the gematria, we could learn about the gesture, stand ten and study. We could learn about the Mishkan pattern and it's like, okay, Boy, that's a lot of schoolwork. That's a lot of thinking. That's a lot of ugh, learning. So what do you do with it? <laughs> well, you make posters and stick them on the wall. Hey, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. It's really interesting that Yahweh gave us. See, he thought of all this stuff. And he says, I'm going to let them participate. How do you participate in study? If you sit in school and you learn arithmetic and spelling, that's one thing. But if it's recess time and you go out and you play football or soccer or basketball, what's got that to do? What's, what does that have to do with reading, writing, and arithmetic? Two completely different things. One is intellectual and the other one is physical. Not so with Yahuwah, with Israel, by golly. What Yahweh said was, Israel, learn these things. Okay. Now, it's recess time, it's fun time, play time. Now get up and do them. How do you do them? By keeping the Moedim, the festivals, and the Sabbath day, Leviticus 23. So by noticing the pattern of the Moedim fit the same pattern of the creation in Genesis 1, 
and it fit the same pattern of the Mishkan laid out in Exodus 25, and it fit the same pattern stacked exactly perfectly synchronized as the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount that Yeshua gave. This was way back in 2004. I all of a sudden, I believe he gave me eyes to see, the, to realize it's all the same communication. It's all the same message. And then it wasn't until a year later in 2005 that I saw the same pattern in the alphabet. So for us to actually walk out the Moedim, we're doing the alphabet. We're keeping, we're, we're, we're engaged in functioning physically, like playing a sport, the same thing we're learning mentally. Reading, writing, arithmetic. Because that's what the alphabet is. It's all about, I said, the gematria, the numbers. That's arithmetic. It's about reading. Okay. Learn, teach and learn is Lamed. But remember what, what Sally said that Yahweh said, and write these words on your gates. He's commanding us to be literate. I hadn't realized that until I heard somebody say it. Well, I'd heard I'd heard it, and you think, yeah, yeah, okay, write these on your gates. So you go buy a little thing called a mezuzah, and you nail it to your gates. That's what the, the doorpost of your house, that's what the Jews do. What's a mezuzah? Well, it's quite often just a little wooden box or metal or maybe ceramic, and it has a little W on it. What's that? Uh, he said to do it. No, no, what is that? Okay, the W is not a W. It's a, the letter Sheen written in modern Hebrew. What's the letter Shin? Well, it's a flame, it's teeth. The word El, Aleph Lamed, is translated God, Mighty One. Shad, Dai, Shin Dalit Yod. Well, the first letter is the letter Shin. Shaddai, the last letter is the Yod. What's the Yod mean? It means my personal possession. Well, then what's Shin Dalit? It's pronounced shad. It's a it's a woman's breast. But it's also, if you look in Klein's dictionary, it's a demon. A demon, my devil, shad I is my 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 demonic adversary. It also means a chest of drawers. It's a it's also a beautiful woman. What? So now you put in your brain, what? El Shaddai. See, if you spell it E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, ah, that's L. That, that, that's a beautiful woman, a beautiful breasted woman. What? That's why it's a stack of drawers. What? Yeah, and I'm just saying, you know, you got these things that become idioms, things that become cliches, things that it's, it's blending of languages. There's French and Hebrew and English and what you'd call jocular, you know, sophomoric humor of messing with words. And it's like, where did it all come from? It comes from El Shaddai. The Hindus have the, I don't know anything about the Hindu religion, but I, I know I've heard or seen pictures of some feminine looking deity with hundreds of breasts. All, it's like, well, how does that even work? It doesn't matter how it works. It's a picture. What's it a picture of? El Shaddai. The Chinese, the most ancient reference of a deity going all the way back to about 2500 BC. Interesting thing about, there's a video, I think it's called The Gospel in China, or The Bible in Ancient Chinese. We could look it up and put it on the chat, but there's a fellow who's teaching in Singapore. He's got a black suit and there's a blackboard behind him, a lady in a bright red dress doing the translating. And he's showing how the the very first figures, shapes, lines drawn in ancient Chinese compose three elements of the Bible. Proof that whoever came up with this Chinese language, it was sourced from the time in the Bible when there was only three stories. The three stories are the Garden of Eden, Noah's Flood, and the Tower of Babel. And then... You have Chinese. Well, what that means around 2500 BC is that one of the guys that was at the Tower of Babel, when, when he always scattered the people, went east and ended up going to China 
and establishing the first Chinese empire with elements, the very beginning of that language with elements of those three stories that had already existed in the early chapters of Genesis. Noah's flood was around Genesis eight. So what is it, up to chapter nine or 10 or somewhere? Wow, it, it just confirms. But Babel then, when Yahweh spun off the other languages, they were permutations or distortions or morphing away from the Hebrew, allowing the bringing in of a type of confusion. I was just reading, or somebody was just telling me, that might be the book of Jubilees, that it addresses this time, and, and, and it says, and whether or not it's true, I don't know. I don't know whether Jubilees could be considered Torah truth or not. I, I don't know. Make up your own mind. But the point is, it's saying that at the time of the Tower of Babel, Yahweh, that's it, <sighs> destroyed Hebrew completely off the face of the earth, uh, me believing that Hebrew was the one common language spoken on the face of the earth at that day. And he put out 70 other languages and sent them rolling in different directions. And it says right there that the people scattered according to what language they spoke. So if everybody's speaking one language, and Yahweh says, hey, you're supposed to scatter across the face of the earth. No, we're going to build one tower unto the heavens right here. They started making mud bricks and Nimrod wanted to climb up in the tower and shoot Elohim in the face with an arrow, as the story goes. And he said, look what they're doing. Okay, he changed all their languages and sent them, and they all left according to their languages. Like, what does that mean? So you, say you have 100 people around you, and all of a sudden, one day, you got 70 different languages. <laughs> you have to stand there and say, blah, 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 blah. does anybody know what I'm saying? You know, hey, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this other guy way over there. Yeah, yeah, blue, blue, blue. Oh, okay. So the people who speak the same language somehow had to find each other in the midst of how many thousands were there. Okay, I guess we're now this clan. Let's head that away. Exit, stage right, stage left, <laughs> up to the hills, down to the valley, off to the ocean, wherever they went, 10,000 miles away. Okay, so you had, it's almost like Yahweh determined who's going to be in each group by giving them that language, and then he sent them. Well, see, the other next time we have a big language event is Acts chapter 2, day of Shavuot, uh, aka otherwise known as Pentecost, 50 days after they started counting at their raising of the uh, cut sheaf right after the crucifixion. 50 days later, they were speaking, and all these people had come there, because that's what you're supposed to do at Shavuot, that was still the command, so everybody that was at Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost, as we now know it called, because the word Pentecost is Greek, penta means 50, like the letter noon, and cost means to count, to count something, what's this cost? How many coins of dollars or shekels do I have to count out to buy this? That's where you get the word cost. It's also where you get the word kuf nun hey, kana, maker thus possessor, the one who took the cost upon himself to now own this by either building it or purchasing it. Kuf nun hey, just so you know. Kuf nun aleph is the word jealous zealous. Kufnun He and Kufnun Alice sound like the same word, Kana. Yahweh is a powerfully jealous. That's We read that sentence last week, I believe, El Kona. O Kona, Kufnun Alice, there's no O sound, there's no Vav in there. It's a supplied vowel, Al Kana, like Kona, Kona coffee, same, same word. What I'm saying is that if you try to translate, what is this word Kufnun Aleph or Kufnun He? What he built, what Yahuwah built, is what he designed, is what he sustained, and he is radically impassioned with zeal, fanatical, obsessive, 
about his stuff to the extent that if we pollute it, if we toss it aside with a casual disregard, he is infuriated. But if we look at it with a fond affection and try to learn it and take it on, he is thrilled. He's thrilled. What we're doing here is the greatest thing that any human can do. And the more you see the depth of his passion that's built into every word of Hebrew because of the way it's spelled, you can feel his maod. You can feel his heart. The pulse of his heart is in this language. And you got to see it for yourself. You have to see it in this language. No other language will do it but the Hebrew. And I think especially the Paleo Hebrew. Stan Tenning could see it in the gesture reference of the modern. I'm not against the modern Hebrew. I believe in Daniel 12, 4, that when the archangel Gabriel commissioned, empowered Daniel to hide the words and seal the book, that Daniel accomplished that task by inventing, designing, and building the modern Hebrew flame letters. <laughs> so if they were commissioned from on high via the messenger, the Malach, Gabriel, to tell Daniel, do this, that he gave him somehow the assistance of encouragement or the assistance of the mental agility to do it, to compose the modern Hebrew. And it had to sustain the beatings and the wrenchings of scientists trying to figure out what it was all these years until now. An interesting thing. Now, we're not supposed to, don't even tell their stories. Don't even mention their names. So I'll, I'll, I'll tread lightly, but there's a story that the chief war god of the Vikings, his, the chief war god, this powerful figure in their lore, he wanted to know something. He lacked something. He wanted to know the meaning of the letters. In, in the Viking letters were called runes, R-U-N-E-S. Kelt, the Celts had something, I think they were called O-G-A-M-S, Ogams, I think. It's referring to the letters. Are they of number value? Are they of phonetic value only? Are they of essence value? What are they? Well, the Hebrew, as I started to say before, is all of that. The Hebrew are phonetic. You can put them together and read them, and then you can assign a value to that and say, oh, I know what that means. C-A-T spells cat. What's a cat? Is it just a sound that comes out of your mouth? Oh, we're going to assign the value that it refers to that friendly little animal or that mountain lion or that tiger, that feline. Use not, we'll use Latin, and, and then we all know what we're talking about, right? Well, this chief war god of the Vikings didn't know what the letters really meant. And he, I don't know the story, I don't want to know, I'm not going to go there, but somehow he determined that if he was tortured, lifted up, suspended between heaven and earth, what was he, nailed to a tree maybe or something? I don't know how the story goes, but somehow if he was suspended and tortured between heaven and earth, somehow he could merit or accomplish the learning of the letters, the runes. What a strange story. Why would they come up with that? Did the Vikings come up with that story? Was it like Daniel Bill Boone killed a bar when he was only three? Yeah, right. What, ha what happened? Um, it doesn't matter what happened. I can invent some stupid answer to the story, or is it just a fable, just a myth? Think about this. The chief war god of the Vikings wanted to learn from what source? Some cosmic knowledge? I, I, I don't know how that works. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. But here's the interesting thing. Who is Yeshua? Is he our God? Well, in Christianity, he's the Christian God. To believe that Yahuwah is the Elohim of Israel, I can't say Yahuwah. Yeshua is my God. What's a war God? A war God. Is a war god the same as the father god? Is the war god the same as a agricultural god? Hey, you shouldn't even talk like that. No, wait a minute. 
Where did people come up with these ideas of Baals, B-A-A-L, Baal, Bet, Ayan, Lamed? Yahweh hates people having Baals, lesser deities. The, the contention all through the Old Testament was his people kept taking on the Baalim, plural of Baals, of the Canaanite nations of their surrounding neighbors. Why? It's what we do. It's what we humans do. It's our propensity. Is it wrong? Yahweh says, I know it's your propensity, but you, Israel, if you're Israel, yes, it's wrong. It's very bad. Do not do that. You cannot be my people and do that. Okay. Thank you. Don't do that. Why do we do that? Something's built into our humanity, our psyche, that gives us this propensity, this, this push in that direction. He, we, we read this verse a couple of weeks ago where he says, do not look to the stars and assign God-like deific power of influence, which he assigned to the peoples of all the earth. What? Somehow, Yahweh built into the human mind, thinking, human, humanness, that they look to the skies and say, there must be deified power here. There must be godlike effect on this. That's where astrology comes from. That's where different sun god, moon god, the constellations became that. Oh, gosh. So why did we study the constellations then a couple months ago? It's because I believe that Yahuwah put the stars in the sky, and when he told Abraham, Genesis 15, hey, go out and sefer the stars. Well, he told him to do it, because the word sefer is not just, it means count. Count the stars? You can't count the stars. Ah, well, it, sefer also means to narrate a story. Hey, Abraham, go out and stare at the stars and compose a story. Give it a shape. The word sefer is, is a hairdresser, a coiffure, who gives hair a shape. If you got an afro, you can cut it into a certain shape, or you can just drag it together and put a thing on it here, <laughs> or you can buzz cut it. Give it a shape. That's the word sefer. Was Abraham a hairdresser? Maybe so. If he's looking at the stars and telling a story, then is that bad? Do not assign deific power to them. But we can assign that I think that the deity who put them there, put them there on purpose, and was he referring to himself, or was he referring to a bunch of other deities? There is no other deity. He must be referring to himself, giving you a type of logic that's going to fit into this thing on the Shema. I'm going somewhere here. So for us to say, how do you read those stars? Well, you got to figure it out. How do you cluster them into constellations? You got to figure it out. I was listening to, I was looking at a video uh, yesterday by Dr. Jason Lyle. It was a little thing, but he's an astrophysicist. He's a Christian, and somebody had asked him about the constellations. And he says, well, the Jews say they think maybe Seth designed the constellations, but nobody knows. Some other people think that Seth came up with the alphabet or Adam had the alphabet. Book of Jasher says that, uh, where I was going with that, I'm trying to tie this together here for you, that when Yahweh, when Elohim scattered all the languages, he eradicated Hebrew and later, a few hundred years later, picked Abraham and gave him back the Hebrew. Is that true? Nobody knows. When he scattered the languages, Babel, across the face of the earth, did he retain Hebrew with at least somebody, one little family? Nobody knows. Did he get, did he get rid of it off the face of the earth completely? Nobody knows. You have legends, you have stories. If he did choose Abraham and give him back the Hebrew, oh, great. What message is in the stars? That's a bunch of astrology. Really? We were talking about it a couple of months ago as if the parallel theme message with the 22 letters of the alphabet was copied in the stars. A parallel wheel within a wheel, or like two wheels rolling together, or fitting together like, like cogs of teeth, of gears, meshing to tell the story of Yahuwah and his covenant with Israel. See, that's the central theme of all creation. I believe knowing this Hebrew alphabet is the theory of everything. Knowing the Hebrew alphabet, 
what the letters mean, that they are actually synchronized like teeth, like gear teeth, that the letters of the alphabet are established in their position with meaning and sequence order is by the Moed lining up with the seven days of creation according to the pattern of the Mishkan validated by Yeshua's Sermon on the Mount. It's the Mishkan pattern. That is what the theory of everything is. It orchestrates all of creation, the entire co cosmos, both seen and unseen, those things that human mind can apprehend. And the word science is to be able to figure out how to catalog it and index it and make it look like it fits to our consciousness by our five senses and by reason and logic. That, that's science. There's nothing evil about science. I know some people hate scientists and I know some people hate people who think Yahweh designed it all. But he then gave us a reference in this Mishkan pattern by which to orchestrate everything. Orchestrate erectology, Ayan Reshkov, order, row, assess, evaluate, compare, prepare, order, dix, uh, dictionary, lexicon, archives, museum, registry, all that are sy synonymous meanings of the word Ayan Reshkov. He built the universe in such a way that the human mind could assess it, see it, organize it, let, stratify it, and talk about it with numbers, with letters, and thematic meaning. He wants us to do this. This is the peak, the pinnacle of human endeavor is to do this very task with his alphabet, Realizing Yeshua is his Mashiach that he sent from heaven to earth as our war lord. Our war lord. Ish Malachma. That's even says Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is a man of war. Yeshua is our war lord. Now, if I say war god, wait, 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 gods. Well, the word Baal also means lord. What? Wait a minute. High priest, I can call him our high priest, but I just can't call him a war god or a warlord. And say, like, wait a minute, it's the role, it's the capacity. What did he come here to do? <laughs> to run the race. He's a sprinter. Aleph Resh Zadi. Resh Zadi means to run. Earth is Aleph Resh Zadi. I'm going to run this gamut, this course, including diving into the depth of decomposition of death and resurrecting out the other side. Pay Zadi. Poof. Pizza. That's Yeshua. That's who this other fellow was to the Vikings. Why would he lift himself, have himself suspended between heaven and earth, attached to some cosmic tree, in order to learn the meaning of the letters? Yeshua did that very task of his own volition on purpose to prove, to establish the meaning of the letters. See, the Viking... War God, warlord, war God was seeking for something that was beyond him, that was not him. Yeshua did the very same fabled action of the Vikings, only it was because it is him. He was proving it was him. Why did he have to die? We addressed that video a couple months ago. Because it was the sequence of the letters already established from before the creation of the planet so that new testament verse that says he was he was crucified from before the foundations of the earth it's like what does that even mean i'll tell you what it means knowing this alphabet it means that when the creator of the heavens and the earth composed a mechanism by which to build the heavens and the earth According to John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was Elohim, it was with Elohim, and through this Word he built, established the entire universe, and then the Word became flesh. It's this Word of the Hebrew alphabet. So, because the Hebrew alphabet includes the concept that one has to come from heaven to earth, from Aleph to Bet, born of a woman, coming through the Gimel gateway of the Dalit, the pelvic entry, of the hay woman and become this Vav man who would then be put to the weapons eye and thrown into the tomb head, the round rock rolled in front head and held shut because he's dead, dead. 
Yod, jump a few letters ahead, three days and three nights, and then Pezadi, the grave opens up and he blossoms out and ascends Kuf unto the Resh status. That's a gamut. That's a course. That's a that's a spectrum display, like the rainbow from red through blue. Visible wavelength. He determined that that series of these 22 letters is, oh, they're just not phonetics. They're not just numbers. Yes, that the heavens are deep and vast, infinite space, whether or not it's infinite. You could take a strip of paper. That's not infinite. Give it one twist and, and attach it back to itself. It's called the Mobius strip in the shape of a figure eight with one twist. And if you were on that, you could run forever, never stop and never get to the end. It's, a, it's, a, it's an infinite course. By giving it a twist, if you, if, if you take a ribbon and attach it to itself, you have an inside track and an outside track. But by putting one twist, you can run inside and outside and never stop and you're covering the whole thing. If the universe was built as a Mobius, Mobius strip and we look with projecting a light or a telescope receiving light, you'll never know if it bends around the strip. You'll never know. It's infinite. My point is, we don't know the shape of the universe. And so scientists use logic. Jim Holt's book said, you know, physics and philosophy walking hand in hand and bumping into religion a little bit. But that's the human mind. That's what Elohim built the human mind to do and be engaged for sport, for fun. Nobody wants to think about this stuff. So don't go, go watch cartoons. Go sit by the river and stare at the, stare at the uh, water, and that's a wonderful thing to do. But he designed the human mind to do this with passion, because it's his passion. He designed this. He designed this. He designed this to be our sport. He designed it to be Israel's sport. And if you find no interest in any of these matters, you could still believe in Jesus Christ and maybe go to heaven when you die. When I say maybe, it's because a bunch of people are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we heal people in your name? What do you mean? He says, depart from me, I never knew you. Well, no, you can't mean us. Depart from me, I never knew you. What does it mean to know him? Jesus Christ is my God. See? Maybe I could call him my war God, but is he my Elohim? Is only Israel going to go to heaven? Uh, the righteous inherit the earth. Do we go to heaven? Or I, I, I don't know. It's another story. We're not going to talk about that right now. What I'm saying is, as soon as you start looking at this stuff, we only know what did Yahweh build? What did he make? What did he say? He put it into words, and he designed human view beings to think and to spell words and to navigate the stars like Navigate is the word haga, where we get the word navy. Hey, gimel, hey, haga, to think, to ponder, to mutter, to, to pronounce words phonetically, steering wheel, helm, rudder. It's all hey, gimel, hey. It, we've talked about this a number of times. I'm reiterating saying to think, to ponder, to poetically put songs together. The original Chinese god was named, bad phonetics here, Shang Di, S-H-A-N-G-D-I, Shang Dai. <laughs> what? Well, however they pronounce it, if you're Chinese, please excuse me, but there's different dialects of Chinese too, but Shang Dai, Shadai, Shadai, hey, that's El Shadai. That's right, comes all the way back to there. Shin Dalit Yod in Hebrew. Gosh. Who's El Shaddai? Well, in, in, the, in the English Bible, it's translated almighty. Almighty. Well, wait a minute, I thought El Shaddai was the breasted one. Wait a minute. Look up Shad in the dictionary. In Klein's dictionary, it says it means chest of drawers, beautiful woman, evil demon, and a devastated field. A, shed, a shad is also a field that's been... Have you ever seen pictures of World War I, the trench warfare, where you've got... Soldiers just a constant bombardment, barbed wire fences and 
broken bodies and just trees ripped to heck. And that's a Shaddai. That, that's a Shaddai. Sheen down at hay, a devastated field. Two minutes left. But it's also the breast of all your, with a mother suckling her baby, of all provisions. Everything you need, including the comfort. That's Shaddai. Sheen is a prefix letter that can mean that which it belongs to, or that which. Dalit. Dalit Yod is the word die. In that movie, Ushvazim, the lady says to her husband at one point, die, die. It, the subtitles say, enough, enough, stop. Hey, what happens in, in English words? What happens when you get to the end of your life? Die, die. I've had enough. That's it. It stops right here. So Dalit Yod, well, Yod is a suffix. It means my. What is the meaning of this Dalit? Shaddai. Hey, Shema Israel, Yahweh, Yahweh, Echad, Aleph, Het, Dalit. We're going to get into this. We're taking a break. What's the Dalit? 